Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we will be talking on the inguinal canal. I am Dr. Daksha Dikshit, Professor of Anatomy, JN Medical College, KLE Academy of Higher Education and Research, Belgavi. Let us see a case scenario. A 7 year old male child was presented at the surgery OPD with a swelling in the left groin. It descended into the scrotum. And there was increase in the size of the swelling when the child cried or coughed. The diagnosis given was of unilateral left-sided indirect inguinal hernia. As we go through the entire class, we will understand why these particular symptoms were seen, what was this swelling and why it had occurred. Why is this? present. Basically, it allows the testis to reach the scrotum. The testis, a pair of male gonads, develops on the posterior abdominal wall. Once it is developed, it starts descending. It is pulled down into the scrotum by a fibromuscular band which is the gubernaculum testis and there are other factors which also help in descent of the testes. A peritoneal sac called as the processus vaginalis descends in front of the testes. It acts as a guide through which the testes descends through the inguinal canal passing successively through the deep inguinal link the inguinal canal and the external or superficial inguinal ring and finally the testis descends into the scrotum. Once the testis completely descends into the scrotum, this processus vaginalis obliterates completely except a part which remains as one of the coverings of the testis which is the tunica vaginalis. In case this processus vaginalis fails to disappear or remains patent or there is incomplete fusion of the walls of the processus vaginalis, this is what gives rise to the indirect or oblique inguinal hernia. Let us see the descent of testis as is shown in this diagram. What we see here is the testis and attached to its inferior pole is the vas deferens. We see the peritoneum. We also see the fibromuscular band that is the gubernaculum testis which is guiding it and pulling it down towards the inguinal canal. What we see in this picture is that the testis has reach the deep inguinal ring which is seen at about the 12th week of intrauterine life. Subsequently, the testis passes through the inguinal canal, reaches the superficial inguinal ring. All along, we see that this sac of peritoneum, the processus vaginalis is moving forwards or in front of the descending testis. What we see in this picture is that the testis has reached the scrotum and here too we see part of the processus vaginalis which covers the testis forming the tunica vaginalis. 
the remaining proximal part of the processus vaginalis gets obliterated. In case this obliteration does not occur, that is what gives rise to a ready-made hernial sac into which the abdominal viscera or contents could easily herniate. Moving on to the anatomy of inguinal canal, we will be discussing it under these headings. Introduction, Location, Extent and Direction, Deep Inguinal Ring, Superficial Inguinal Ring, The Boundaries or the Walls of the Canal which would be the anterior wall, posterior wall, the roof and the floor. Then we would see the contents of the canal, the various mechanisms which keep the integrity of the inguinal canal and then we move on to the different types of inguinal hernias. Inguinal canal, what is it? Basically, it is a natural hiatus in the tissues of the anterior abdominal wall. It is a deep musculo-aponeurotic or musculotendinous canal which is seen present along the medial half of the inguinal ligament. It is formed from various layers of the wall in the region of the groin. Its size and form vary with age. It is present in both the sexes, most well developed in the males. Location, extent and direction. As I have said, it is located just above the medial half of the inguinal ligament. It extends between two openings, the deep inguinal ring and the superficial inguinal ring. Measures in adults anywhere between 3 to 5 centimeters and averaging we say that it measures 4 centimeters in length. The direction of the canal is downwards, forwards and medially. So, it is an obliquely running canal seen in the groin region. It is a musculo-aponeurotic tunnel. Let us go on to study the two openings. Deep inguinal ring. It is an oval opening with an almost vertical long axis. It is an opening seen in the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. That is, it is an opening in fascia transversalis. Where is it located? It lies 1.25 centimeters above the mid inguinal point. What is this mid inguinal point? It is midpoint of a line joining anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis. It is different from midpoint of inguinal ligament. Inguinal ligament extends from anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. Midpoint of this would be the midpoint of inguinal ligament. Related above the deep inguinal ring are the arched lower margin of the transversus abdominis muscle and medially it is related to the inferior epigastric vessels and the interfoveolar ligament when it is present. This picture shows us the deep inguinal ring. It is an oval opening seen in the fascia transversalis related above to the arched fibers of transversus abdominis and medial to it lies the inferior epigastric artery behind the fascia transversalis. So, relations of the deep inguinal ring would be superiorly or above they have the arched fibers of transversus abdominis. Inferomedially, inferior epigastric artery behind the fascia transversalis and at times the interfoveolar ligament which extends from the conjoint tendon 
to the superior ramus of pubis. Anteriorly and laterally are the inguinal fibers of external oblique muscle. Those are the structures related to the deep inguinal ring. Moving on to the superficial inguinal ring. This is a triangular opening in the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. The apex points along the deep fibers of the aponeurosis, while the base lies along the crest of pubis. Its sides are the crura of the opening in the aponeurosis. This opening measures about 2.5 cm from apex to base and 1.25 cm wide at the base. What are the boundaries of the superficial inguinal ring? The base is formed by the pubic crest. The apex is directed above and laterally, formed by the convergence of the two crura and is kept in position by the intercrural fibers of external oblique. Medially, it is the superior crust of the ring which is attached to the symphysis pubis. The superior crust is thinner as compared to the inferior crust. Laterally, the opening is bounded by the inferior crust, which is fixed to the pubic tubercle. This inferior crust is more stronger and resilient, curved and is where the spermatic cord rests. This is a picture which shows us the triangular opening which is the superficial inguinal ring. This is the base of the ring and this is the apex. This is the medially placed crust and this is the laterally placed inferior crust. So, this is the superior crust and this is the inferior crust of the superficial inguinal ring which is nothing but a triangular opening in the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. What are the boundaries of the inguinal canal? The inguinal canal as we know is a virtual space lying between various layers formed by the lower tissues of anterior abdominal wall. So, boundaries would be anterior wall, posterior wall, roof and floor. Let us study the structures which form the anterior wall. The anterior wall along its entire extent is formed by skin, superficial fascia and the external oblique aponeurosis from outside within. In the lateral one third, the anterior wall is partially formed by the muscular fibers of external oblique muscle just above their origin from the inguinal ligament. These are the structures forming the anterior wall. Entire extent is formed by skin, superficial fascia and the external oblique aponeurosis and along its lateral part partial formation by the muscular fibers of inferior oblique muscle which take origin from the inguinal ligament. Moving on to structures forming the posterior wall. The posterior wall of the canal is entirely formed by fascia transversalis which separates the canal from the extra peritoneal tissue and the peritoneum. This wall is partially formed in the medial half by the conjoint tendon which is also known as the inguinal falx in front of the fascia transversalis. What is this conjoint tendon? It is a common tendon of insertion for the 
the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. Also, partially formed by the fibers, the reflected part of the inguinal ligament which lies in front of the conjoint tendon. This is seen in the medial one-fourth of the posterior wall. So, posterior wall entirely formed by fascia transversalis. In the medial half, it is formed by the conjoint tendon and in the medial one-fourth, it is formed by the reflected part of the inguinal ligament which is in front of the conjoint tendon. Here we see the structures forming the posterior wall. Entire extent we see the fascia transversalis and in the medial part of the posterior wall, the conjoint tendon which lies in front of the fascia transversalis and in front of the conjoint tendon in the medial one-fourth would be the reflected part of the inguinal ligament. Let us see the structures which form the roof of the inguinal canal. Laterally, it is formed by the fascia transversalis. Centrally, by the musculo-aponeurotic arched fibers of internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles. And medially, the roof is formed by the medial crust of the external oblique aponeurosis. The floor is formed laterally by the iliopubic tract, centrally by a gutter formed by the infolding of the inguinal ligament and medially by the lacunar ligament. What is the inguinal ligament? Inguinal ligament is nothing but the inferior upturned or infolded part of the external oblique aponeurosis which extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. So, the floor laterally formed by iliopubic tract centrally by a gutter formed by the infolded inguinal ligament and medially it is formed by the lacunar ligament. It is here near the floor that the posterior margin of the inguinal ligament fuses with the fascia transversalis. Let us now go on to see what is this iliopubic tract. Thickened inferior margin of the fascia transversalis, which appears as a fibrous band running parallel and posterior or deep to the inguinal ligament. It reinforces the posterior wall and floor of the inguinal canal as it bridges the structures that traverse the subinguinal space. The inguinal ligament and the iliopubic tract span an area of innate weakness in the body wall in the inguinal region which is called the myopectineal orifice. This myopectineal orifice is a site of direct and indirect inguinal hernias. Lacunar ligament of Gimbernat. It is a thick triangular band of tissue lying mainly posterior to the medial end of the inguinal ligament. It measures approximately 2 cm from the base to apex and is a little larger in males. It is formed of the fibers of the medial end of the inguinal ligament. It is also called as an extension of the inguinal ligament. So, it is formed from fibers of medial end of inguinal ligament and fibers from the fascia lata of the thigh which join the medial end 
of the inguinal ligament from below. So, that is what the lacunar ligament is. This picture shows us structures which form the roof and the floor of the inguinal canal. Here we see the roof which is formed by the arched fibers of two muscles that is internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles. Whereas here we see the floor which is majorly formed by the inguinal ligament. Now let us see what are the contents of the inguinal canal. We have two types of contents, complete contents and partial contents. The complete content of the inguinal canal is the spermatic cord in males and the round ligament of uterus in females, while the partial content in both the sexes is the ilioinguinal nerve. The ilioinguinal nerve enters the canal by piercing the internal oblique muscle about 2.5 centimeters below and medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. This nerve is situated superficial to the spermatic cord and it leaves the canal by passing through the superficial inguinal ring. So, contents, complete contents, spermatic cord in males, round ligament of uterus in females and a partial content in both the sexes is the ilioinguinal nerve. What are the various mechanisms which help in maintaining the integrity of the inguinal canal? First point to be remembered here is the obliquity of the canal with the superficial and deep rings lying some distance apart from each other. The canal lies obliquely. Hence, in cases when the intra-abdominal pressure increases, the posterior wall moves forwards and gets approximated to the anterior wall. This is a flap valve-like mechanism and obliterates the inguinal canal. The second point of importance is that the anterior wall is reinforced by the internal oblique muscle in front of the deep inguinal ring. The deep inguinal ring is a defect in the posterior wall. Thus, anteriorly, this defect is reinforced by the muscular fibers of internal oblique muscle. Similarly, on the posterior wall, there are the fibers of the conjoint tendon which lie just behind the superficial inguinal ring which is a defect in the anterior wall. Thus, these defects, both the external or the superficial inguinal ring as well as the deep inguinal ring are reinforced reciprocally by tendinous or muscular fibers. This helps in maintaining the integrity of the inguinal canal. The next point to be remembered is the Keats shutter mechanism. The arched fibers of internal oblique and transverse abdominis which form the roof of the inguinal canal, they behave or act like demi sphincters. When the intra-abdominal pressure increases, these arched fibers contract and bring down the roof and approximate it to the floor. This movement occurs like a shutter mechanism where the roof is brought down to meet the floor. This is the Keats shutter mechanism. Next is the plugging action of the cremaceter muscle or the cremaceteric plug. In cases of increased intra-abdominal pressure, the cremaceter muscle contracts and that pulls up the testis which reaches towards the superficial inguinal ring and blocks or plugs this outlet like 
a ball valve mechanism and the last is the elongation of the canal and narrowing of the lumen when the anterior abdominal muscles contract the deep inguinal ring is pulled upwards and laterally and this is what elongates the inguinal canal and narrows the lumen all these features help in preventing the occurrence of an inguinal hernia and that is how they protect the integrity of the inguinal canal moving on this picture shows us how the keith's shutter mechanism works what we see here are the arched fibers of internal oblique and transversus abdominis which form the roof During increased intra-abdominal pressure, these muscles contract, and that's when these arched fibers are brought down. The entire roof coming down as a shutter and approximating with the floor that is the inguinal ligament, and that is how the inguinal canal is obliterated or compressed. And this is the shutter mechanism. now that we have understood the gross anatomical features of the inguinal canal we saw the two ends that is the two openings the deep inguinal ring and the superficial inguinal ring we also studied the features which form or which form the boundaries of the canal now let us go on to see the applied anatomy aspects the most important point here is the inguinal hernia what is a hernia a hernia is nothing but an abnormal protrusion of an organ or a viscus through a normal or an abnormal opening inguinal hernias are seen as abnormal protrusions of the abdominal organs or viscus through the inguinal region so they involve protrusion of a viscus through the tissues of the inguinal region of the abdominal wall the inguinal hernias constitute 75% of all the abdominal hernias they occur in both the sexes 85% occur in males because of the passage of the spermatic cord through the inguinal canal we have already understood this when we explained the descent of the testis wherein a patent processus vaginalis a processus vaginalis which fails to obliterate it remains as a ready made hernial sac into which the contents of the abdomen can easily herniate giving rise to inguinal hernias there are two types of inguinal hernias indirect or oblique inguinal hernia and direct inguinal hernia indirect inguinal hernias constitute more than 2/3 of all the inguinal hernias they are 20 times more common in males and about 1/3 of these hernias are bilateral whereas direct inguinal hernias are rarely seen to occur in women and whenever they occur they are mostly bilateral indirect or oblique inguinal hernia these are characteristically defined as arising lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels these are mostly congenital due to the presence of abnormal persistence of the processus vaginalis they are seen in the younger age group the neck of the sac is narrow the hernial sac enters through the deep inguinal ring travels through the entire inguinal canal it may extend through the superficial inguinal ring above and medial to the pubic tubercle based on the extent of the hernial sac these indirect inguinal hernias 
could either be incomplete or complete. A complete indirect inguinal hernia is one in which the hernial sac reaches up to the scrotum. Sometimes these indirect inguinal hernias may be acquired due to progressive weakening of the lateral and anterior walls of the inguinal canal. These hernias are much more common in males and they are more common on the right side. Why is this so? The left testis is said to descend earlier as compared to the right testis. Thus, the left side processus vaginalis will be obliterating earlier as compared to the right processus vaginalis. Hence, more chances of the indirect inguinal hernia to occur on the right side as compared to the left. This picture shows us the indirect inguinal hernia. This is the deep inguinal ring, this is the inguinal canal and that is the superficial inguinal ring. What we see here is the peritoneal sac, the processus vaginalis. The testis has descended into the scrotal sac. This is the tunica vaginalis, covering of the testis formed by the processus vaginalis. The proximal part of the processus vaginalis has failed to obliterate, giving rise to a ready-made hernial sac into which the abdominal contents will easily herniate. These type of hernias are congenital. They are seen in younger age group individuals. Thus, the coverings which we will see in this type of a herniation would include the peritoneal sac, the extra peritoneal tissue and all the coverings as are seen in the spermatic cord which includes the internal spermatic fascia, the cremaceteric muscle and fascia, the external spermatic fascia, then the darter's muscle and the skin. Let us explain or understand how this happens. As the hernial sac enters into the deep inguinal ring, it will have a covering from there which is the internal spermatic fascia. As it passes through the inguinal canal, it will receive the covering of the cremaceter muscle and the fascia. As it leaves the superficial inguinal ring, it will have a covering of the external spermatic fascia. These are similar to the coverings which the spermatic cord gets as the testis descends through the inguinal canal. So, indirect inguinal hernias follow the same route that is followed by the descent of the testes. As I have already explained earlier, two types of indirect inguinal hernias, incomplete and complete. When the hernial sac extends up to the scrotum, it is complete. Anywhere in between, if it stops, it is an incomplete type of indirect inguinal hernias. We have different types which have been described. Vaginal or complete, this is when the processus vaginalis remains patent along the entire extent and the hernia reaches base of the scrotum in front of testes. Next is the funicular type. Here, the processus vaginalis is obliterated above the testes and remains patent only in the proximal part. Next is the infantile part. Here, in front of the hernial sac, a peritoneal recess extends from vaginal sac as high as the superficial ring. Next is the interstitial type, rarely seen when a diverticulum of processes extends between the layers of the developing abdominal wall. This interstitial type 
could be further subdivided into three types as superficial, intramuscular and proparietal. Superficial is when the diverticulum is seen between the superficial fascia and the external oblique aponeurosis. Intramuscular is wherein the diverticulum lies between the internal oblique and the external oblique muscles. Whereas the proparietal is where the diverticulum is seen between the fascia transversalis and the parietal peritoneum. Moving on, let us see what is litter's hernia. In cases when the Meckel's diverticulum enters into the inguinal hernia or is a part of the inguinal hernia, such hernias are called as litter's hernia. Going on to direct inguinal hernia. These hernias are defined as arising medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. These are acquired inguinal hernias due to weakness in the inguinal or Hasselbach's triangle which is seen in the medial posterior wall of the inguinal canal. These frequently extend through the anterior wall of the canal or through the superficial inguinal ring. The neck of the hernial sac is wide. These are mostly seen in old aged group individuals. What are the boundaries of this Hasselbach's triangle? It is a triangle seen along the medial aspect of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. It is bounded medially by the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle, laterally bounded by the inferior epigastric artery and inferiorly or the base of the triangle is formed by the inguinal ligament. The direct inguinal hernias which occur through the Hasselbach's triangle are further divided into two types, medial and lateral. Medial is when the sac enters through the medial inguinal fossa and lateral wherein the sac enters through the supravesical fossa. These two are demarcated by the obliterated umbilical artery. Direct inguinal hernias are more likely to have a wide necked origin, thus making strangulation of the hernia less likely. This picture shows us the direct inguinal hernia. As is seen here, the defect or the weakness lies in the muscles or structures forming the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. These hernias do not characteristically pass through the inguinal canal. They begin around the Hasselbach's triangle, directly project or proceed forwards or anteriorly. They pass through the superficial inguinal ring and may or may not descend down up to the scrotum. Clinical features of inguinal hernias. With the patient in supine position and the hernia reduced, pressure is applied over the region of the deep inguinal ring. This will prevent appearance of an indirect inguinal hernia on standing or straining. This is difficult when indirect hernias have wide neck. Occlusion of deep inguinal ring may not be possible with single digital pressure. Acquired indirect hernias may arise medial to the deep inguinal ring. Let us now see how to differentiate between 
indirect inguinal hernia and direct inguinal hernias. Indirect inguinal hernias are congenital while direct inguinal hernias are acquired. Frequency and age distribution. Indirect, very common, two-thirds or three-fourths of inguinal hernias are indirect. They occur congenitally and in younger age group and are usually unilateral. Direct inguinal hernias are less common among inguinal hernias, seen only as one-third or one-fourth of hernias. They are seen in elderly patients above the age of 40 years and are usually bilateral. What is the direction of hernia? In indirect inguinal hernia, the hernia is directed downwards, forwards and medially. While in a direct inguinal hernia, it is directed almost straight forwards. What are the predisposing factors? Indirect inguinal hernias are congenital. So, patent processus vaginalis gives rise to such hernias. While direct inguinal hernias are acquired, the weakness in the anterior abdominal wall muscles near or around the inguinal triangle of Hasselbacks gives rise to such hernias. Exit from the abdominal wall. Indirect inguinal hernias carry peritoneum of processus vaginalis and all the three facial coverings as are seen in the spermatic cord, while direct inguinal hernia will have peritoneum and fascia transversalis. Enter the inguinal canal through deep inguinal ring in indirect inguinal hernias and through the inguinal triangle of Hasselbach in direct inguinal hernia. Neck of the hernial sac in indirect inguinal hernia lies lateral to the inferior epigastric artery, while in the direct inguinal hernia it lies medial to the inferior epigastric artery. Course Indirect inguinal hernia will traverse the entire inguinal canal when it is complete variety of hernia within the processus vaginalis. So, it will go through the deep inguinal ring, inguinal canal, external or superficial inguinal ring and down into the scrotum, while direct inguinal hernia passes through the medial third of the canal, through the Hasselbach's triangle, straight forward into the superficial inguinal ring and down into the scrotum. Exit from anterior abdominal wall. In indirect inguinal hernia, it is going to exit through the superficial inguinal ring inside the cord passing into the scrotum. While a direct inguinal hernia will pass through the superficial inguinal ring lateral to the cord and it rarely enters the scrotum. These are the characteristic distinguishing features between indirect and direct inguinal hernias. Let us see what are the coverings of the indirect inguinal hernias. When these hernias are complete, then the coverings of the hernial sac from outside within would be skin, darter's muscle, external spermatic fascia, cremacetric muscle and fascia, internal spermatic fascia, extra peritoneal connective tissue and the peritoneal sac. While in an incomplete indirect inguinal hernia, the coverings would be skin, cremacetric muscle and fascia, internal spermatic fascia, extra peritoneal connective tissue and the peritoneal sac. Similarly, let us see what would be the coverings of the direct inguinal hernia. Here again, two types, lateral direct inguinal hernia and medial direct inguinal hernia. In a lateral direct inguinal hernia, the coverings of the hernial sac would be skin, darter's muscle, external spermatic fascia, 
क्रमेसेट्रिक फेशिया इन क्रमेसेट्रिक मसल फेशिया ट्रांसवर्सैलिस एंड पेरिटोनियल सैक वेर एज इन अ मीडियल डायरेक्टिंग वाइनल हर्निया इट वुड बी स्किन डार्टस मसल एक्सटर्नल स्पमेटिक फेशिया रिफ्लेक्टेड पार्ट ऑफ इंग्वाइनल लिगमेंट कॉन्जॉइंट टेंडन फेशिया ट्रांसवर्सैलिस एंड द पेरिटोनियल सैक दस वी अंडरस्टैंड that based on the type of hernia the coverings of the hernial sac also would vary moving on to other points of applied anatomy what we need to remember and understand most groin hernias in males pass superior to the iliopubic tract because these are mostly the inguinal hernias while in females most of the groin hernias pass inferior to the iliopubic tract because these are the femoral hernias because of relative weakness the myoepithelial orifice is overlaid with prosthetic mesh in the extra peritoneal retroinguinal space which is called as the space of bogros in many hernia repairs cysts and hernias of canal of nuck in women if the process vaginal is persists then an indirect inguinal hernia may extend to the labium majus in female infants such remnants can enlarge and form cysts in the inguinal canal thus we have gone through the descent of the testes the anatomy of the inguinal canal where we studied the location extent the two openings the boundaries which included the anterior wall posterior wall the roof and the floor we then moved on to see the contents of the inguinal canal which we classified as complete contents and partial content and then we went on to see how the various mechanisms help to prevent the formation of inguinal hernias we also saw the two types of inguinal hernias direct and indirect along with their subdivisions we studied the mechanisms of the herniation the coverings of the hernial sacs and other applied anatomy aspects of the inguinal canal let us now see one more case scenario a 65 year old male patient with history of bronchitis and constipation presented at the surgery opd and complained of noticing a swelling in the right groin since the past 2 months the swelling gradually increased in size and when he felt dragging and aching pain at the site on physical examination the doctor noticed a lump above the right pubic tubercle which expanded on coughing after manually reducing the swelling and occluding the deep inguinal ring with thumb the patient was asked to cough the swelling reappeared medial to the thumb the diagnosis made here was of direct inguinal hernia we have seen two case scenarios the first at the beginning of the lecture which showed or which said about a 7 year old child having herniation on the left side so unilateral herniation in a young child is most probably due to a persistent processus vaginalis and that becomes an indirect or an oblique inguinal hernia whereas the second case scenario which we see in an elderly person wherein the swelling is seen 
increasing with straining and coughing is most probably a direct inguinal hernia which is caused due to the weakness in the anterior abdominal wall muscles and such a hernia is going to come through the Hasselbach's triangle. Such we have gone through two case scenarios, one for an indirect inguinal hernia and the other for the direct inguinal hernia. Thank you.